Praise the Lord. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight and welcome to Elizabeth City Baptist Church. It has been a beautiful day today. We've had some beautiful weather and I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, let's go ahead and stand. Brother Philip will lead us in our first song. Brother Philip. Let's sing about the Holy Bible, page 181. 181, as you stand and follow me in the blue hymnals now, singing all four verses, 181, on the first verse. Holy Bible, book divine, precious treasure thou art mine, mine to tell me whence I came. Mine to teach me what I am. On the second verse now, everybody. Mine to chide me when I roll. Mine to show a Savior's love. It's mine thou art to guide and guard. Mine to punish or reward. On to the third verse now. Mine to comfort in distress, suffering in this wilderness. Mine to show my living faith. Men can triumph over death. Fourth and the final verse, lift it up now. Mine to tell of the joy to come. And the rebel sinners do. Oh, thou holy book divine, precious treasure. singing amen and let's open in a word of prayer let's pray lord we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in church tonight and lord we thank you for the beautiful building the parking lot the beautiful weather that you've given us lord thank you for giving us the strength and the freedom to come together and worship you tonight lord i pray that your holy spirit would work through the service lord help us to remove any distractions that are burdening our mind lord throughout this week and we ask all this in jesus name amen you may be seated Good to see all the boys on the front row. Zane, good to see you. Always happy to see Zane. We had a uh, wonderful time with the uh, roller skating activity, and we had over 20 people from our church come, and we put some uh, uh, pictures and a video up on the Facebook page, and uh, it was a whole lot of fun. And my daughter, Tears, uh, she, she was going so fast, it was almost scary fast, and she would fall down. And then uh, Lily and Logan, I think by the end of that two-hour period, y'all were cruising. And it's almost like the two hours needs to be four hours because by the, the in the first two hours, that's just training. You spend the first hour following, the second hour learning how to skate, and the next two hours would be a lot of fun. We had a wonderful, wonderful time, and um, it was a blessing. I'll go ahead and read our weekly report and then a couple other announcements that we have. I uh, had a wonderful week financially. The Lord's been very good to us, and thank you for your faithfulness in tithes and offerings. And uh, our general fund offering was $8,392.25. Our missions offering was three thousand dollars and thirty five cents. Uh, I checked today and I think our missions account uh, is right about um, I want to say ten or eleven thousand dollars. So that is excellent. Excellent. This last year we took on more missionaries for more money than we had the year before. And the Lord continues to bless. Now, our building fund, we of course, the children give to the building fund through the church there. As I've mentioned before, the building fund is to help us raise money to buy our church building back. And that would be the next um, uh, financial goal that our church has, not to rent this building, but to be able to fulfill uh, that financial obligation. And we're working that way. Um, but if you'd like to give to the building fund, you can do so by marking it um, on the offer envelope. If you don't mark it on the offer envelope, we can't direct it towards that. Um, but anyways, we had $22,600 come in, come in this week for our building fund. And that brings our total in our building fund to $2,708.43. And then, of course, we still have a surplus left over from the parking lot project. So um, in truth, that number is probably closer to four thousand dollars. So that's exciting. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Now, Sunday school, we had wonderful attendances. We had 55 in Sunday school. 
And uh, I, I think that might be a Sunday school record. I think our Sunday school record was 53 or 55, but it was right close to that. So we had 55 in Sunday school and then 97 in church and our, our largest Sunday morning attendance ever. So it was exciting to see that. And I'm excited to see the uh, auditorium full and the parking lot full. People were parking all over this property. Uh, Sunday evening, wonderful attendance. We had 37 in church. Wednesday night, last Wednesday night, we had 26. 13 on Saturday, uh, soul winning. And of the 13 that left, 13 came back. And so we praise the Lord for that now. That's, that's not a guaranteed anymore. And uh, we had one person say, uh, at least one person saved. And we had a, a wonderful reception. Went to a neighborhood off a of north side road that we had never been to before. And it took some doing to get back there. But the Lord uh, greatly blessed us there. Um, our, our nursery, I, I um, uh, it's just about done. We had the TV up on Sunday, and now the TV's down, but the, the, the cable is in. Okay, So by Sunday, we'll have that up and running, and that nursery project will be completely finished. Um, but tomorrow, Brother Scott and I are going to start on the uh, kitchen. And uh, in, my, in my Sunday school class, um, well, I, I announced it two weeks ago, and then we took up a collection for it this last week, and we had $610 come in towards this kitchen project. And I know maybe not everyone's privy to what we're doing, but we're going to uh, build a, um, a a counter basically with a, with a two foot countertop and a backsplash, and then we're going to put a um, a have a have an opening for a door, so that way it'll separate our small kitchen from our small fellowship hall. And so, uh, but anyways, uh, the money that we've raised at six dollars should be enough to get that built for the most part. And then uh, Brother Scott is also looking for good deals on, on counter, or not counter, but on um, cabinets. So we're going to start that project tomorrow. And so when you come to church on Sunday for the breakfast, um, most of that, Lord willing, Lord willing, uh, will be done. Um, praise the Lord for that. Okay. Um, wonderful. I'm going to read, probably read this here in a bit. We'll go ahead and take up our offering. Brother Tim, Brother Ryan, if you all gentlemen could please come up for the tithes and the offering. Go And we have a new giving verse now being in the month of April and our giving verse comes from Luke chapter six and verse 38. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. I love that verse because it is a promise, not from me and not definitely not from our church, but a promise from God that as you give to the Lord, so it shall be given unto you. And then it says, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. If you give a little to the Lord, the Lord will give a little to you. Give a lot to the Lord, the Lord will give a lot to you. And that's what that verse is teaching us. Brother Tim, would you please pray for the tithes and offerings? Yes, Lord. Amen.
I'm ready to have church now. That was good. Praise the Lord. Put a pep in your step in the right kind of way. Okay, not not a groove in your move, but a pep in your step. There's a different, okay? There's peppy songs and then there's rock songs. There's a huge difference. Oh, boy. At, at, well, I'll just confess. At, at my house, we like to listen to some old uh, folk songs, um, you know, such as Oh, Susanna. And uh, what was, um, what was I, I'm asking my dog in the front row. I can't remember. I shouldn't. Don't tell. Don't tell anybody what goes on in the house. But we listen to some old folk songs and some from the from the Civil War and everything. And the children will jump around and jump in the corner. But it's a different it's a different kind of of um, beat, per se. OK. And so it's interesting because when you listen to music like that, it'll make you tap your toe and it'll make the children jump. But when my children go into Walmart and hear the rock and roll type beat, it makes them shake their hips. So it's interesting to see. I don't know what that has to do with anything. I don't know. Brother Ryan, come on up here and, and pass these up. That was the point. That was good music, okay? That was good, okay? Amen, amen. That's what I meant to say. Praise the Lord. Amen. And, uh, yep, Brother Ryan, if you get those out as quick as you can, I think we should have a, enough. I apologize. I was I was not late for church, but later than uh, usual. Uh, Brother Philip and his family got here a little after 6, and I was still here in work clothes. And so it was just a uh, busy, busy afternoon. Um, but at least we're here now. Amen. And I think we just about, did we get this side yet, Brother Tim? Nope. All right, Brother Ryan, you're going to have to move faster, Brother Ryan. Come on. Come on, Brother Ryan. Yes, you can run. You can run. 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 Praise the Lord. <laughs> Who's the pastor of this church? <laughs> I don't know, but we need to talk to that guy. Lord have mercy. All right, some praises. Let's talk about some some good things the Lord has already done. As I mentioned, we had a record attendance on Sunday. We also had eight first-time visitors. I think we might have had more um, than those, uh, but we had at least eight of them. And so that was a huge blessing. And we had family people, family members that are people in our church that brought their family members. There was a couple guests I did not recognize that I didn't get a chance to talk to. And uh, with, with so many people, it's hard to... Uh, it's just hard to catch everyone, you know, and uh, but anyways, the Lord um, definitely blessed um, our efforts on that Sunday. Miss Linda Jensen, continue to pray for her for her next hip replacement coming up. The McCardles, pray for their move to Elizabeth City. Miss Linda Wise is, is still recovering at home. I've not heard any news um, uh, towards her as far as, as far as good or bad. So as they say, no news is good news, but continue to pray for her recovery. Now, Pastor John Charles, we've been praying for him. He pastors over in Yorktown, Virginia. Um, I had tried to call him about two weeks ago and it just things did not work out. He called me today and we, I spoke to him for about an hour and he has pastored there in Yorktown, Virginia uh, since 2009. But prior to that, he pastored 11, 11 years in the Outer Banks in Manio. And uh, he was he gave me the history of independent Baptist churches in this area and in the Outer Banks and then gave me some just North Carolina history in general. And of course, he has pancreatic cancer. So his physical health is struggling. But let me tell you, he is spiritually strong. And if you think you have something to complain about or something to feel sorry about yourself for, um, you know, he is he is facing pancreatic cancer and he understands the realities of that. Uh, but he is rejoicing in the Lord. And um, I was encouraged talking to him. So he's going to preach for us in the month of May on a Wednesday night. And of course, I'll announce that well in advance. But you will receive a blessing, blessing, sorry, uh, coming to hear him preach. Him and his wife will be driving um, one one Wednesday night in May. And um, continue to pray for Mrs. Whitley, our military station, and the Miss Tracy. She has a friend, Rick, that she is praying for. And uh, for Rick, that he would just have peace and pain management. He also has um, his pancreatic, pancreatic cancer as well. And I'm also for his dear wife that she would find peace, but find peace in the Lord. And uh, if we don't have the Lord, I don't know where we could ever find peace. You know, that verse in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto the understanding. There's some situations where there's... There's no answer for it. You just have to trust and know that God knows everything. God controls everything. And if you've prayed and if you're right with the Lord and something is still happening, just realize that it's God's divine will um, that it happens. But please do pray for uh, Rick and his dear wife, Miss Bob. Now, um, uh, on our church planners, uh, Pastor Andrew Merritt, we've supported him for over two, year, two years now. He's uh, planted the Upstate Baptist Church, which is in um, Albany, New York. It's so all the way up in New York. And I wanted to read part of his um, missionary update letter. And he writes, I'm glad to report the good blessings God has bestowed upon us. We serve a faithful and true God that takes good care of us. 
Please continue to pray for us as we are entering into warmer and longer days, especially in New York. OK, if you if you're from there, they know what winter's like. Uh, I desire, he writes, that we would capitalize on these warmer days and months ahead as we work to do a great work here. We experienced a good amount of visitors during the month of March. One of these visitors is a young man in the college at the University of Albany. I'm encouraged that he has been coming to church every Sunday since he first came. We had visitors come on Resurrection Sunday, which was a great day in number and in the services. He goes on to write that he is continuing to, uh, to, to, to go soul winning. He writes that he and his wife, they don't have any children as of yet, but he and his wife had four other people come with them soul winning. And so this is a, a, a young church. I'm, I'm a younger than us. We're a young church as well. But there have been multiple people from their church come out soul winning. He closes by saying, on Resurrection Sunday, we had a family visiting with us that none of us had ever met. They were visiting family in this area but are from Connecticut. Just as God does, I sincerely believe we had this family come because of our soul winning efforts. We do not always see the people we meet out soul winning come to church. Amen. That happens here too. But God is faithful to bless his business of soul winning. I love that. Uh, this family was helped and one of the daughters received assurance of her salvation. One of the ladies we were able to recently see, see saved got baptized in the morning service. I rejoice in the blessings of the day. May God continue to help us as we seek to win souls. That's good. And uh, But he is praying um, for... Uh, just for the need there for people to be saved. And then he prays for many visitors. So I ask that you continue to keep him in your prayer. Uh, my brother, um, uh, Benjamin, they had a wonderful Sunday as well. But they're in Grassfield. They had 26 on Sunday morning. And uh, they are having some of the, the people in their church get involved with serving. And so that is good because those are some things that a young church needs. So praise the Lord. And thank you for your support of missions and uh, missionaries. All right. Um, oh. I'm sorry, my mind is not in the game tonight. We need to go ahead and pray. We're going to pray over these prayer requests, and then please keep the list with you until next Wednesday. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for being good to us, Lord. Before we ask you for anything, Lord, we first want to ask you to forgive us our sins, Lord. Lord, I pray that you forgive us for the things that we've said, the things we've thought. Forgive us for not always being in the Spirit, Lord, and not always being spiritually minded. Lord, forgive us for getting too busy to serve you and to spend time with you. Well, we pray that you would help us, Lord, and that your Holy Spirit would continually convict us when we stray off the path you have for us. Lord, we do thank you for your blessings at our church, Lord. Lord, we've seen financial blessings at our church with our missions front growing and increasing, Lord. Give us wisdom in how to use that to get the gospel around the world. Well, we thank you for our blessings in our building fund, Lord. I pray you help us as we, uh, as we try to purchase this building, Lord, to fulfill that financial obligation. And Lord, purchasing it, uh, if anything, to show the community, Lord, that we are here to stay and to show that your work is being blessed. Lord, we thank you for the, uh, the uh, blessings in attendance, Lord, for the Resurrection Sunday and all the people that came out. I thank you, Lord, for all the people that came out tonight on a Wednesday night, Lord. I know Wednesday nights can be difficult to come to. Lord, we lift up Miss Linda that you continue to help her and strengthen her, Lord, and that you would prepare her for this next hip replacement coming up. We pray for Brother Philip and his family, Lord, as they prepare to move to Elizabeth City. Guide him, direct him, give him wisdom, Lord, and open up doors of opportunity. But we pray for Miss Linda Wines. We pray for Mrs. Whitley, Lord, both of them. Um, Lord, doing doing okay, but still struggling, and we pray that you'd continue to help them improve. But we lift up Pastor John Charles, Lord, and suffering with pancreatic cancer. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, and I pray, Lord, if it be thy will, that you'd heal him of this cancer, Lord, if you do. I know that he'll continue to serve you faithfully for the rest of his life, Lord, as he's done for many, many years. I thank you for his testimony of serving the Lord faithfully year after year. And, Lord, I'm excited about having him come to our church. I pray you bring that to pass. Well, we pray for our military that are stationed overseas abroad. We pray for our uh, the National Guard troops and even the Federal Border Patrol on our southern border, Lord, as they are so important, Lord, to our national security. Lord, we pray for... Uh, Miss Tracy with her dear friend Rick, I pray for this man and his dear wife, Lord. I pray that if they do not know you as a personal Savior, that they would be saved, Lord, and that they find comfort in the Holy Spirit. And, and Lord, just help them and comfort them, be with them in this time. We pray for our church planners, Lord. What a privilege it is to support these, these men of God that are carrying on your work. We pray for Pastor Andrew Merrin and the Upstate Baptist Church in Albany, New York. And, Lord, from what I've been told, starting a church up north is more difficult than starting down in the south. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help this dear man, him and his wife, Caitlin. I pray you bless them with visitors, Lord. I pray you bless him with wisdom as he leads this church. We pray for Brother William Whitehouse, Lord, the Peninsula Baptist Church. Lord, we've been supporting him um, for, uh, for almost three years. 
And Lord, I thank you for his work there. I pray you continue to bless it. We pray for the Scary family, Lord, that you would provide the rest of their support and help our church to continue to be a blessing, Lord, to have a part in this family, winning people to Christ in Italy. Lord, we pray for my brother and that you continue to bless him and the church there in Grassfield. We pray for Brother Jacob and Rachel Berry, Lord, and, uh, and, 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 and their family in Waterville, Maine, planting the church there, Lord. I know that they are working hard and doing well. I know there have been struggles and difficulties, Lord. I pray that you provide his need and strengthen his faith, Lord. Lord, we pray for Brother uh, Craig Bryan, Lord, and the Ron Middleton Missions Outreach, Lord, reaching people literally all over the world, Lord, and, and missionary works all across America and all across the globe. We pray for Brother Brian that you give him good health, that you continue to fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for all that he and his ministry have done for our church. Lord, I pray in this Bible study that your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth, Lord. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles to Revelation chapter 16. All right. Revelation chapter number 16. Praise the Lord. And I'm excited. There is a lot that takes place in Revelation chapter 16. But I believe that we will make it all the way through before Jesus comes. Amen. <laughs> Could you imagine Jesus coming while we're studying Revelation? Now, that would be ironic. We'd have something to talk about in heaven for a long time. Amen. I hope that Jesus comes right as we're reading like Revelation 19, 20, or even better, 21. You know, right? We're in the last chapter. But, amen. Revelation chapter number 16. I make my way there. Now, we're going to do a brief overview from last week. So I'd like to read, just in case you missed last Wednesday evening, uh, let's read Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. So on my Bible, they're both on the same page. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. The Bible says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So, so you have the seven angels are introduced. They have seven vials. And those vials, if you can imagine, a, um, a what I imagine, a, a narrower glass, almost something that a chemist would put something in. So I'm just imagining that um, as John is writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he is seeing, seeing the seven angels step forward, and they have the seven vials. And in those vials contain the wrath of God. And the wrath of God that has been building up since Cain killed Abel. Think about that, Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel, and already there's a murder that's been committed. And uh, the Bible said about, um, about Abel that the voice of his blood or the voice, the voice of his blood was crying out unto God from the ground. So think about all the innocent blood that's been shed for the last six to 10,000 years and all of that blood crying out unto the Lord. So if Abel's righteous blood that was shed was crying out unto the Lord, how much more all of the other innocent people that have been killed? So the wrath of God is about to be poured out. This takes place in the second half of the tribulation. Now, when we read chapter 16, you'll notice that all seven vials are poured out. Um, but I, I, I would not take that to mean that they're all poured out in the same hour. Um, you know, there's the, there's the timeline of the last three and a half years, so they could be poured out every few months. The Bible doesn't say, but I'm not imagining necessarily that it's one, and then 10 minutes later it's another, and 10 minutes later another. I'm not saying it can't be. But, but uh, probably I would imagine that they'd be spaced out a little bit, also just looking at the different judgments that we have. So uh, now, that being said, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 1. And the Bible says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So now things are about to pick up in an awful, awful way for the people on the earth, and they will begin to pour these vials out. So um, remember that uh, obviously the scriptures are inspired by God, but God used men to pin down the Bible. So John is physically seeing this, okay? So John is seeing, per se, and in some sort of vision, in some sort of spiritual way, but he's physically seeing a vial. He's physically seeing an angel. That's why he wrote there were seven angels because he saw them, and he's seeing them pour a vial. Now, all the destruction that we're going to read about on the earth Obviously, that was not happening on the earth when John penned the book of Revelation. Okay, that was not happening. That was something that the Lord allowed him to see into the future. But I'm imagining John being in heaven and seeing seven angels having seven vials and pouring them out. And then God supernaturally allowing him to look ahead and to write down what he said. Because you have to think about the physical. I mean, John was a real person. Okay, John was a real person. He wasn't an angel. Um, so men writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Now, we're going to look at all seven of these vials this evening. The first... Um, 
The first vial, let's read verse number 2, Revelation 16, 2. And the Bible says, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Now, obviously, these, these um, judgments that are being... Uh, that are being brought on the earth are against the people that have already received the mark. And as the Bible has told us, if you receive the mark of the beast or you worship the image of the beast, uh, that there is, to put it basically, there's no salvation, okay? That you've crossed a line with the Lord. And the Bible already made that very clear a couple chapters before. Now, um, a noisome and grievous sore. Uh, this would be something similar to, and a lot of, a few of these um, judgments are similar to. When, when God plagued the Egyptians, okay, when God plagued the Egyptians. And in Exodus chapter 9, this is when uh, God's speaking to Moses and Aaron, and Moses and Aaron are speaking it to Pharaoh. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh, and it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So Moses takes this, this dust and throws it up, and it becomes boils and blame. Basically, these awful sores um, all over uh, the people of Egypt. And the same thing is going to happen in the tribulation, but it's going to happen unto all the people that have the mark of the beast. You'll notice there are two adjectives about this sore. It's noisome and it's grievous. Now, the way that the word noisome is used here in the Bible is different than the way we would use it today. In fact, we wouldn't really use it today. When you look at the word noisome, I think noise, I think sound, but that's not what it means. Uh, the word noisome means offensive to the smell or other senses. It means disgusting. It means fetid, which is just something, just an awful smell. So if you can imagine uh, you know, the, the worst thing that you've ever smelled. I remember going on a trip to Oklahoma when I was growing up, and on the way, um, on the way back, my dad realized he had, of course, turned all the power off in the house just to be safe, but he forgot that he turned the power off to the fridge and the freezer. And so all the way back, that 22-hour drive, he said over and over, children, do not open the fridge and the freezer when you get home. Of course, you know what my sister did. Sisters. My sister went right into the house and threw the, and boy, the smell, I mean, it was awful. Of course, we had to throw the fridge away, but it stunk the house up to high heaven. So this boil, this sore upon these people, it's going to stink. It's going to smell awful. They won't be able to rub it away. There'll be no medicine for it. There'll be no way to deal with it. That word grievous basically means afflictive, painful, hard to be born. So these men, or the women too, these people that have worshipped the beast and have taken the mark and the, uh, and the mark of the beast are going to have these sores on them that are going to stink. They're going to smell awful. It's going to be painful. They're going to be scratching. They're searching for relief. And, of course, there will be no relief. So that's literally going to be happening as the first uh, vial of God's wrath is poured out. Now, uh, number two, and look at verse three. Look at verse three. Some interesting details here. Verse 3, the second vial, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Now, this could be a broad, a broad interpretation of the sea would mean all of the salt water in the world, right? That's what it's referring to, salt water. We'll see that. Or it could be a reference to the Mediterranean Sea, because, of course, during the tribulation, and, and even all through history, the focus is on Israel and the focus is on the kingdom of the beast and armor, everything. Since so when it says the sea, when in John's time, the sea, he would have referenced the Mediterranean Sea. You know, John wouldn't have necessarily known about the Atlantic Ocean or Pacific Ocean. So this could be that to mean all salt water or it could just be the Mediterranean Sea, one, one or the other. But it says it became as the blood of a dead man. Now, I'm going to give a... Uh, possible explanation as to what this could be. Now, when we read about these supernatural things happening, God does, God never has to have a scientific reason and purpose to do it. Okay, For example, um, when the Bible says that the sea became as the blood of a dead man, there doesn't have to be a scientific reason for why it happened. God could snap his fingers and all the salt water and all the earth become literal blood and could kill everything. God could really do that. But here's something interesting, okay? Did you know that there is a phenomenon called the red tide? Anyone heard of the red tide? Okay. Yo, there's some smart people in here. Goodness gracious. All right. Well, for the rest of us, okay? I, I didn't know. I didn't know. The phenomenon called the red tide. These red tides kill millions of fish and poison those who eat the contaminated shellfish. 
Now, in 1949, one of these red tides hit the coast of Florida. At first, the water turned yellow, but by midsummer, its color changed, and it was filled with countless billions of dinoflagellates. Okay, dinoflag, these microscopic organisms. It killed much of the marine life, and even the live bait used by fishermen were killed when cast into the sea. Eventually, the red tide subsided, only to appear again the following year. So this is something that happened in Florida. It's, it's well documented, and I believe it's happened other times throughout the world, where the sea, the salt water, literally became red. It killed everything off. The fish died. The marine life died. Contaminated everything. It would go away and then sometimes come back the following year. So it could be. Now, it doesn't have to be, but it could be that there is a massive red tide throughout all the oceans and seas of the world, and it all takes place at the same time. That would be a pretty good explanation. I'll also imagine when that happens during the tribulation that the food supply that comes from the sea will be lost very, very suddenly. Last night, I was reminded of that when my wife cooked salmon for her and I, because salmon costs more, and cooked some tilapia for the children. Okay, That's what you call smart thinking. Tilapia is cheaper, and there's more children than there are of us, so they had tilapia, but we had some salmon. But there will be no, uh, no, no food that you'll be able to get from the ocean. So the food supply will be drastically um, cut off when that happens in the tribulation. Now, uh, the third vial, the third vial. Let's read Revelation chapter 16 and verse 4. And these are just, I mean, bam, 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 one after the other. Not a lot of verses about each one. Revelation 16, 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Okay, so with the, the salt water is now contaminated, whether that's all salt water in the earth or the Mediterranean Sea, regardless, with the salt water being contaminated, now the fresh water also has been contaminated. So the rivers and the fountains, so um, the fountains, the water coming up, so all the water okay, on the earth has been contaminated. Um, now maybe the, the, the people that are living on the earth during the tribulation, perhaps they have water that's in reservoirs or in containers or bottles, maybe, maybe that will be spared. But regardless, that water is not going to last very long because all the lakes and the streams and the, and the, the freshwater uh, bodies of water will be contaminated virtually overnight. So the food supply has been cut short because of the salt water being contaminated. And now the freshwater has been contaminated. So now there's less drinking water. Okay, so you can imagine the anarchy and the chaos that is taking place throughout the world. Now, um, I, I had read this before, and I don't know if it's a famous quote from somebody, but Someone once said that every society is only nine meals away from anarchy. Some of you probably heard that before. In other words, what that means, if there was literally no food, okay, people could deal with no food and missing a meal or maybe missing a day. But if somebody does not eat for three days in a row and their wife does not eat for three and their babies don't eat for three days in a row, things really get bad quickly because people in that, in that, in that desire to survive will do terrible, terrible things. And we necessarily have not seen that in America, maybe maybe localized when Hurricane Katrina hit and things like that and, and other, but in other countries, in the country of Haiti right now or in, in African countries um, or even over in Israel where they're having a hard time getting aid through. I mean, they're literally fighting for food because they're fighting for survival. And if it comes down between feeding my family and feeding your family, I'll pray for you, okay? But I'm going to feed my family, okay? And, that, that's, and, and I'm a nice person, but I'm going to take care of my family. So just imagine the anarchy that's going to be taking place all across the world. Now, in Revelation chapter 16, okay, as we read about these vile judgments, maybe, maybe you might feel just a, uh, just a tinge of sympathy for the people on the earth. And I think God knew that some people would. And so there's two verses that are put right here in the middle. Verse 5 and 6 of Revelation 16. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be because thou hast judged thus. So God is judging these people very severely. God is finally, after all of these years of putting up with sin and wickedness and, 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 and perverseness and iniquity, finally God has poured out his wrath, and it's right. It's right. The Bible says, the angel says to the Lord, thou art righteous. So the Lord is not um, demeaning. He's not, this is not another side of God. This is the side of God that has always been present but has been held back by the dam of God's mercy. But in the second half of the tribulation, God's wrath will be poured out once and for all. In verse number 6, the angel says, For they have shed, they being the people on the earth, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. 
That tells us that God has a sense of humor, okay? You might even call it a dark sense of humor. Oh, you've shed the blood of my followers, where now you're going to be drinking blood. And that's ex Is that what the angel said? That's exactly what the angel said. Amen. Amen. Now, all right. Um, ver um, verse, number, um, verse number 8 and verse number 9, we see the fourth vial, the fourth vial. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. What a sad state that they did not repent to give the Lord glory. Now, this is interesting. These judgments being inflicted upon the people that have the mark of the beast. Remember, God already said a couple chapters ago, if you take of the mark of the beast, that you're going to, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, you're basically going to partake of the, the wrath of God. So, no, you cannot be saved. But still, even though they cannot be saved, they still refuse to give God glory. Remember, God has already, they've already crossed that line with the Lord, but God still wants them and would expect them to repent and to give the Lord glory, even though he knows that they've already taken the mark of the beast and they've already crossed that line in the sand. Now, uh, this is here's another practical, uh, practical explanation. Again, it doesn't mean that God has to work this way, but when it says that the angel poured his vial upon the sun, and the, 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 the power of the angel and the power of the sun was used to scorch men with fire. Um, the sun, in its normal state, pours out a continuous stream of high-energy particles that race toward the earth at a peak speed of 3 million miles per hour. The earth is surrounded by a field of radiation called the magnetosphere, which protects it from full exposure to this deadly assault. But if anything should but if anything should happen to the magnetosphere, the earth would immediately be bombarded by these highly dangerous particles. So God doesn't have to, but God could, and it might make sense, basically supernaturally remove that field of radiation that protects us from the sun and from the heat of the sun. And then the sun would come blasting and scorching these people with a heat that would feel as if they were being scorched with fire, which is interesting. It doesn't mean that God has to work the way God could just snap his fingers and make anything happen. He doesn't need the magnetosphere. He doesn't need to pull back that radiation, or, or sorry, that field of radiation that protects us. But that could be um, a possible explanation for what's going to happen during the tribulation. Uh, we move on to the fifth vial in verse number 10, 11. Revelation 16, verse 10, 11. The Bible says, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their swords, and repented not of their deeds. They, they, are nev they will never, ever, 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 ever be willing to repent and to get right with the Lord and to give what it say before, to give God the glory. It doesn't matter how much God does, how much God proves himself, they will never turn into the Lord. Now, a couple um, uh, uh, phrases here to, no to notice. The fifth angel, when he poured out his vial upon the seat, of the beast, what that is referencing is basically the capital um, of the, the the beast, the Antichrist, and his power. So the seat, it's not just where he sits, but it would be the seat of his power. So just as we would have Moscow in Russia, Paris in France, London in the UK, and D Washington DC here in America, the seat of the beast, okay, wherever he is reigning from, wherever his central powerhouse is, is going to be smitten with darkness also says that his kingdom was full of darkness. Now, when it says his kingdom, we've already laid that foundation. The Bible says that there will be a ten-kingdom confederation under the Antichrist. So it is not going to be a one-world government. And, you know, that's, that gets thrown out a lot that the end times is going to be a one-world government. There is not, because not all the nations of the earth are under the thumb of the Antichrist. We're going to read here in a bit that there's kings of the east that will war against the Antichrist. And it, it, a whole, whole other thing. But... There will be ten nations. The Bible makes that very clear. That will be um, have a form of confederation under the Antichrist. So the Antichrist, his seat, his capital, wherever his headquarters is, and all of those ten kingdoms will be smitten with darkness. Now, it makes you think about this. Okay, if it's smitten with darkness, what does that mean? What does that mean? Now, let's say that you know the electricity went out here. Okay, we would instantly be thrown into darkness. But we could pull out a battery-powered flashlight. We could have generators, and we could still have light. And if anything, we could light candles, and we could. Uh, we could we could have a bonfire, but uh, what does it mean when it says it'll be so dark that 
Um, I mean, there's, there's obviously they have candles and fire. What does that mean? Probably this means that the darkness will be so thick that light will not penetrate. Um, my wife and I were watching this, this uh, short documentary, and it was talking about people scuba diving, but, they were, but cave diving. And cave diving is one of the most dangerous you know, sports to be called in all the world because not only do you deal with the dangers of scuba diving, but people would go in these, in these caves, and sometimes you're, uh, you would get stuck in the cave, and people would take a wrong passage. All these things would happen. But one of the most dangerous parts of cave diving is when you get down in there, there is silt on the bottom of the cave, and you might be in an opening that's only this tall and yay wide, and you're trying to swim and scuba dive. If you are not careful and you disturb the silt that's coating everywhere, the silt will basically go everywhere, sort of like if you have a light of um, the sun comes into your house and you've got a lot of dust in your house, like mine, and you see all the, all the dust that's flying everywhere. Our windows don't open. That's why, we don't have, that's why we have so much dust. So all the dust is flying everywhere. When that happens, when they're cave diving, they shine a flashlight, and it's like the flashlight, the dust part, the silt particles are refracting the light, and the light is literally no good. Now, you could probably hold it right here and see that, but it is of no practical purpose. So when the Bible says that if there's going to be a darkness and they're going to gnaw their tongues for pain and that, you know, there's not going to be a flashlight way out of it, it will be so dark, okay? It'll be so dark that even if they light a candle, even if they have a flashlight, the darkness will completely smother it out. And so I think that's probably the best explanation for that. It's not simply a loss of electricity and a an automatic killing of all flashlight batteries. I think rather it's just so dark that no light that they have that any human could come up with can penetrate that darkness now here this is do i miss something this is very this is very interesting in verse number um i'm sorry give me just a second i think i skipped a page in my notes okay there we go um god did the same thing sorry i got ahead of myself but god did the same thing to the egyptians and i'll read the, the passage from exodus 10 the lord said unto moses stretch out thine hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Okay, so an extreme darkness. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. All right, does that mean that their candles just automatically went out and they couldn't light them? No, that's not what it means. It means the darkness was so prevailing and so powerful that even though they lighted candles, the light wouldn't go anywhere. It was of no practical use. And then the Bible says, back in Exodus, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. For three days. So it was so dark, they didn't even leave their house. So this wasn't just that the sun was out in Egypt and they had a little candlelight. So if God did that to Egypt, it would just simply make sense that God would do a similar thing during the tribulation, that it would be so dark that no light, even electricity and flashlights, no light would be able to penetrate that thick darkness. Now, we get on to the sixth vial in, in verse number 12. And this is where things get interesting. The sixth and the seventh vial. Verse number 12. The Bible says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now that's a lot in one verse, okay? Um, let's try to look at it as simply as we can. The Euphrates River of course, it's going to run through Iraq, and, and it's, a, it's a very important river in the Bible. Um, in fact, the children of Israel, their territory is supposed to be from the great river in Egypt, the Nile River, all the way to the Euphrates River. Of course, they don't have it now, but one day they will. But the Euphrates River is indeed a formidable obstacle to, uh, to an advancing army. And even historically, the Euphrates would be a natural boundary line. Uh, because not that armies could not cross the river, but it was very difficult, and they'd have to cross the river under fire. It wasn't like they had today where they could put some C-130s and they could fly some people over the river. This Euphrates River is 1,800 miles long, and in some places, not all, but in some places, it's 3,600 feet wide, okay? So that would be over half a mile wide in some places and 30 feet deep. Now, it, when, I, when I think of it today, and I think of it in, in the context, with the technology that we have today, we don't, you know, a river, whether a river's there or not, doesn't necessarily slow us down because we have helicopters and we have planes and we have airfields, and that's how armies work. Rivers don't necessarily are not a huge um, problem. So it makes me wonder, okay, and I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm thinking. It makes me wonder with all of the uh, trauma that takes place on the earth during the tribulation, Will in some ways technology be taken backward? 
For example, we have full cell phones. So we think, well, we got cell phones, we can we have GPS, all these things. Well, if the if the cell phone towers go down and if the grid collapses and the grid goes, and when you read through the tribulation, let me tell you, this, this is a brother Philip, this is the grid down scenario. Okay, this this is a prepper's dream. Prepper's dream that stuff like this would happen so they could use this fifty thousand dollars worth of gear. If this never happens, I'll have to take all the stuff back. This is a prepper's dream come true. And if you're a prepper, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So maybe because of all the destruction that's happened, maybe technology, we've been brought back to the age of where, hey, we don't have helicopters. Now, maybe they're rusting somewhere. They've all been, I mean, think, they don't destroy. We don't have things. We don't have planes. That would make sense for the Euphrates River to be a boundary if they just have, the, if the kings of the east have this massive man army that are soldiers, okay, that maybe are brought down to just having uh, rifles and, and, you know, small arms. But, I mean, you just have to wonder. Because with the planes and helicopters that we have today, the Euphrates River for any modern army is not a barrier. It's just not a barrier. So it makes me think that maybe that's um, that's what it'll be is a lot of the technology will be lost. Now, it says the kings of the east, okay? The kings of the east, as far as we can tell today. Now, the superpowers may be different 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 200. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. But as far as we can tell today, this would, I would say, include China. Okay, the kings of the east, I mean, they're, they are a superpower for sure. India also is a very powerful country. Indonesia, if it ends up siding with China over the U.S., could be a very powerful country. And I know Japan is our ally, but they could be wrapped into that. So when it says the way the kings of the east, east of the Euphrates River. So you have to think, who are the superpowers today, east of the Euphrates River and China and India, to my mind, are the first two that come up. And sometimes, you know, we, we get... Uh, we forget about all the what's going on in the world. Um, you know, not far from the land of Israel is the country of Turkey. And I believe that Turkey is going to play a huge role in the tribulation as we get close to time the Antichrist. Did you know Turkey has the second largest army in NATO? Okay, so America has the largest and we have the second. That I had no idea, no idea. And so sometimes it doesn't make the headlines, it doesn't make the news, and you don't realize that Turkey, this country, that is a bridge historically has been a bridge from, from Asia to Europe. It's, it's always played a major role throughout the world that Turkey has the second largest army in NATO. So um, the armies of the East will come. Now, this is interesting, okay? When it says the way the kings of the East, they're prepared, they're crossing over the Euphrates River. And you say, why are they crossing the Euphrates River? You say, well, they're, they're marching toward the Battle of Armageddon. Well, not, not yet, not necessarily. This, this uh, way of the kings of the east, remember I mentioned this before, the Antichrist has a ten kingdom confederation, but he does not control all the nations of the earth. And we read in the Old Testament, remember, where there will be some nations the Antichrist will not be able to contain or to conquer. So the way of the kings of the east, as they're prepared, as they're marching toward, okay, toward across the Euphrates River, marching probably to march against the beast to put down his rule and to take control. And when you read about the beast, the Antichrist, and his ten king confederation, it seems to make sense that it's going to be of Western nations. Uh, you know, the first Western nation that we think of, if it's around in the tribulation, will be our country, America, and, and France, and, and, and Spain, and the UK. So the Western powers have basically ruled, for the most part, have, have had the upper hand, especially since World War II. So when the Antichrist comes to power, he puts together his ten kingdom confederation. If that's a European or Western nations, okay, as we would be and as the European nation would be, the way of the kings of the East, they finally might be ready to make their move and to dominate the world. China and India and those nations, you can see it's all of those nations building up their military. North Korea, throw them um, in, in, in on the list. And you say, well, how do, what do you mean? So if they're marching against the Antichrist, how is the Antichrist going to stop them? Well, that brings us to the next verse. And in verse number 13, And I saw, John writing, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So this is the satanic trinity. And what are they going to do with these uh, spirits? Verse 14, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. You see, the kings of the east were not going to march to Armageddon just because the Antichrist said so. The kings of the east were not going to march to Armageddon just for, for the spoils of war. They were deceived by the Antichrist. So the Antichrist deceives them, and so now they're not a foe. Now they're an ally of the Antichrist, and now the, 
Euphrates River has been dried up so that it, they're prepared to cross over, and now they're preparing to fight the Battle of Armageddon. But the Antichrist tricks them into doing this. So this is how all of these nations will be fooled into thinking they can defeat God. Now, also, if you notice in verse number 15, this is a powerful verse. This verse tells us a lot about this period of the tribulation. Behold, Jesus says, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, verse number 15, is that a message to the unbelievers, the people that have the mark of the beast, the people that have the image of the beast? It's not, okay? It's not. They are not looking for the coming of the Lord. They've not repented to give him glory. There will be believers on the earth in this time that are living under great persecution. Remember, Satan has great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. And Jesus gives him a word of hope as they are reading the book of Revelation during the end of the tribulation. As they hear on the news or, or somehow they see the Euphrates River is dried up, they know that Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. They come in surprise. Now, this is interesting. Um, four times in Revelation, Jesus says, I come quickly. In other words, it's, it's in the future. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming soon. I'm coming quickly. But now he says in verse 15, behold, I come. So when the Euphrates River is dried up, those believers that are still on the earth that have not been martyred by the person of the Antichrist, they will know the Euphrates River has been dried up. The kings of the east are making their march. Jesus is coming, not the rapture per se, but the, the second return of Christ. And they're going to read that and know that they are going to be watching. That's what says, blessed is he that watcheth it. The people that worship the image of the beast, they're not watching for Jesus. They're not watching. They, they, they hate God. They hate Jesus. And, and I mean, they didn't repent. Uh, they, no matter what the Lord did, these are for the believers that are there. So it's interesting that Euphrates River, when that dries up, that's the very next verse. They'll know that the second coming of Christ is uh, coming very, very soon. Verse number 16, the Bible says, And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. This is where we see that Armageddon um, is, is, is the valley where the battle will be fought, of course, in chapter number 19. So the Euphrates River is dried up. The kings of the east are coming, perhaps to fight against the Antichrist. But before they get there, the Antichrist fools them with these, with these miracles and these false wonders. And now they're going to be drawn to Armageddon to fight against the Lord. Now, we've got to look at the seventh vial, and then we'll be finished. Verse number 17. Verse number 17. The Bible says, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne, saying, It is done. Reminds me of the phrase when Jesus says, It is finished. What is done? What's he mean? It's done. Well, the wrath of God is done. Remember, he's pouring out his great wrath, first vial, second, third, fourth, fifth, fifth, it's fifth, and the sixth, and then the seventh, and then he says, It is done. Now, the next two chapters of Revelation 17 and 18 um, are concerned only with mystery Babylon. And so once these seven judgments are complete and God says it is done, the next events on the world stage, as far as the world's concerned, is the second coming of Christ and then the, the, uh, the battle of Armageddon. So when God says it's done, that means the wrath of God has been poured out. Everything has been set. The stage has been set for Armageddon. Jesus comes riding a white horse and us with him. He stands, puts his feet upon the Mount of Olives and splits it in two. Praise God. And the battle of Armageddon is fought. Now, um, there is a, a fifth and final earthquake mentioned in Revelation in verse number 18. And there were voices, thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. There are four other earthquakes mentioned in Revelation. This is the fifth, and this will be worse than anything you could ever imagine. The effects of this earthquake are very drastic. Verse 19, the Bible says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That great city, from Revelation 16 to the end of Revelation, that phrase great city always refers to Babylon except for the end of Revelation when it refers to New Jerusalem. Early in Revelation, that phrase, great city, does apply to Jerusalem. But I don't think God's going to destroy Jerusalem and put it in three parts before he comes to save Jerusalem. So this great city would be Babylon. And also other nations will be destroyed in this earthquake. But verse 20 says, every island 
fled away, and the mountains were not found. So quite literally, the entire geography of the world is going to be changed. It says that every island fled away. Um, earlier in Revelation, do you remember it, early in Revelation when there was a great earth? The Bible says that the, the islands were moved out of their places. So they were moved. Now they're fled away. They're, whoo, they're gone. doesn't say they're destroyed, but they fled away. They could also be submerged, okay, if there's a great enough earthquake. It says the mountains were not found. And if God says what he means, and he means what he says. So the mountains were not. In other words, the earthquake is so great that the mountains are brought down. So you're not going to go to, the, to Colorado, look to the west, and see the Rocky Mountains. The mountains could not be found. This is a massive earthquake. And still, the Battle of Armageddon is yet to be fought. Finally, the, part of the uh, final part of the seventh seal is the worst hailstorm ever. Hailstorm, sorry, ever. The Bible says, It fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about, about the weight of a talent. Now, how heavy is a talent? What exactly does it mean? There are three numbers in my research that I saw. Maybe you've heard something different. One fellow said that they were about 55 or 56 pounds. That's a big hailstone. Another fellow said 113 pounds. And another uh, Bible commentator said it could be as much as 125 pounds. If you have a study Bible, maybe one of those numbers are in there. I'm looking here. Um, yep, my study Bible says equal to 75. So there's another number. So but regardless, these things are extremely heavy. The heaviest hailstone ever recorded was found in Bangladesh on April the 14th, 1986. And you know how much it weighed? A meager, well, I say meager, but 2.25 pounds. And that's the largest. And I saw a picture of it compared to it's much larger than a tennis ball. And it got all sorts of pokey things coming out of it. It was, but these talent, or sorry, these hailstones that will be thrown down out of heaven, by, out, directly out of heaven, will be between 50 75, 100, these will be massive, and that will complete the seventh vial and the ending of God's wrath upon the earth. Now, next week, as we march into chapter 16 and chapter 17, we'll get into Mystery Babylon, and it is indeed a mystery, and I'm excited about getting into that. Brother Philip, if you'll come up here, and Miss Molly, for our closing song, thank you for your attention tonight. I hope it was a blessing to you. And, uh, of course, we'll have Saturday soul winning, 10 o'clock sharp. Looking forward to it. Looks like we'll have some beautiful weather. And I know the Lord will bless us. Let's all stand if you're able to. Brother Philip, lead us in a closing song. We'll be dismissed. Please join me at 604 604. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. God bless you all. We're going to see you for soul winning and for Sunday morning service. 604, you shall be dismissed. Here we go. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere we go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier and his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you all. You are dismissed.